Hey guys, welcome back to How to Roll Dice. I'm Josh, and today we're going to be doing a review and walkthrough of this game here, Terraforming Mars by Stronghold Games. Terraforming Mars is a great one to five player game that has those players taking on the roles of corporations who have moved to Mars and are attempting to take advantage of the recently designed plan to terraform the planet. In doing so, they're going to be developing all sorts of corporate projects from this deck here, which are going to gain them lots of abilities and victory points and allow them to develop spaces on the planet with cities and greeneries and oceans and specialty projects like mining plants and atomic volcanoes. Uh, and in the process, they're going to be increasing the use three factors here that have to do with actually terraforming the planet. So you've got the oxygen track that you need to get from zero up to 14%, the temperature tracker that you need to get from negative 30 up to plus eight Celsius, and the oceans tiles that need to be placed onto the planet's surface. There are nine of those. Once you've done those three things and fully sort of maxed out all three of them, the game is over. And whoever has successfully developed the largest terraform rating and gained victory points from their various project cards, as well as the tiles that they've placed onto the planet's surface, will be the winner. So this game is currently rated number four on BoardGameGeek.com. I've played quite a bit of it, and I think it's pretty fairly rated. I have enjoyed it quite a lot. I don't have many issues with the game, but there are some slight failures uh, when it comes to the different uh, components of it. But I'll get into those in a minute. First off, let's look at what comes in the box. You've got this lovely map here. I really like this map because it is super scientific looking and it's actually super accurate from what I understand. This depiction of Mars is covered in various labels and sort of geographic locations and those are actually sort of realistic. They're, they're based off of where they actually are on the planet. Where the ocean hexes are, these blue hexes, which is where you can place ocean tiles, are actually the low points on the planet where, where we assume oceans would actually pool. Um, where these greeneries are or where these leaves are that meant, are meant to represent plants that you gain when you place tiles on them. Those are across the equator where green or green plant life would actually develop most likely. Um, and then these different factors that go into terraforming the planet, raising the temperature up to plus eight on average, getting the oxygen up to 14% and having 9% ocean, uh, ocean coverage on the planet is actually what we think scientifically would, it would take to terraform the planet to make it habitable. So that's pretty cool. Um, so moving on from the board, which other than the map, you've got a few other things. You've got your Terraform rating tracker going around the outside. You've got your standard projects, your milestones, and your awards. I'll get into those. Uh, you have your player sheets. These player sheets are sort of my first sticking point with the game. This sort of not even cardstock paper that these player sheets are printed on is not what you would expect from a game of this quality, of this rating, uh, and of this cost. I was a little let down with that. I don't know why they didn't go with a thicker cardboard, but they get the job done, that's fine. Um, those player sheets are going to depict your six resources, your mega credits, your steel, your titanium, your plants, your energy, and your heat that you're going to use to do certain actions throughout the course of the game, to play project cards, um, and to terraform the planet. Each player is going to start out with one of those. Uh, you've also got your player one token here. Uh, that's to denote who's going to take the first action during the uh, phases every round. You've got these different cardboard hexes that you're going to use to place onto the map to denote the different things that you've sort of built out, the greeneries, the oceans, the cities, the different specialty locations. You have these three different colored metallic cubes here, bronze, silver, and gold. Those denote resources. Um, the bronze count as one resource, the silver count as five, and the gold count as 10. The second downfall in the design, in my opinion, is these cubes here, these uh, metallic cubes. They're not just meant to represent your mega credits, your money. They're not just meant to represent your steel or your titanium. They're also meant to represent your plants and your energy and your heat and their metal. It's really confusing, especially when you factor in that some of the player cubes, these colored translucent cubes, match more closely some of those resources. For example, there is a green colored player uh, that's gonna play with the green translucent cubes. And it's really gonna screw with their head the first time they play their game to remember that their plants are actually counted using the metallic cubes. And the only place they're gonna stick a green cube is on the production track, one single cube, to show what their current production of plants is. The metallic cubes actually count as the plants. That really takes a minute to get over, and I get why they chose to do it this way, and it works fine once you wrap your head around it, but it's really kind of silly at first to try to explain to people. Um, so like I mentioned, translucent player cubes in different colored plastics, red, blue, green, yellow, and black. Uh, and then we have these large white opaque cubes here. Those are actually used to track two of the planet's terraforming factors, the oxygen rating and the temperature. And then the third is used to track the current generation. 
So every generation is meant to be 10 years on the planet. You start on generation one, and every round you're gonna move the tracker up one. Now in a multiplayer game, that's just meant to show you how long it took you to terraform the planet. Oh, it took us 14 rounds, that's 140 years, cool. Uh, in a solo player game, which this does have a solo player mode that's quite good, I tried it myself, um, you actually only have 14, uh, excuse me, 14 generations to achieve the goal of the game. Uh, if you don't make it by then, you've actually lost. You've failed to survive on the planet and terraform it successfully. Um, so those are your opaque cubes. Moving on to these cards here, we have some player reference cards. There are two sets of four, so you can lay them out on either side of the table if you're sitting all the way around the table with your friends. And those basically give you a rundown of the different phases, the different actions you can take, how tile placement works and how different tiles score, and then end game scoring, just so everybody can keep that in mind. You have these two sets of corporation cards here. So during the game, they recommend that you begin with these beginner corporations. Everybody starts with the same amount of money. Everybody starts with the same number of cards. Nobody has any special powers. Then you have these sort of full, you know, beyond learner mode, full scale corporation cards. Um, those give you varying amounts of money, varying resources that you can start with, or even resource production that you start with. Normally you start with zero resource production in all six categories. You might have some abilities that you get to take advantage at the beginning of the game, or some abilities that you can use throughout the course of the game. Um, so those are sort of the full scale corporations. I would recommend starting with those if you're comfortable with this type of game, this sort of level of board game, because they're not all that complicated and they don't disbalance the game in any way that I would consider severe. They're not broken or anything like that. Um, but either start with the beginners or start with the advanced, or if you want, some players can start with the beginner and some can start with the advanced. It's up to you. Um, and then you have these project cards here. Again, these project cards by default are broken into two different stacks. You have your standard project cards and your corporate or your corp project cards. The game recommends that you start with just the standard cards because they're slightly simpler and they're not as focused on an, um, sort of attacking or manipulating your opponent's stuff, whether it be their resources, their tiles, their cards. Once you work in the corp cards, there's a lot more of that going on. There's a lot more player to player interaction. Um, so the game gets a little more competitive, slightly more aggressive. I feel like if that's the kind of thing you're okay with, mix those in right from the get-go. They really don't make things that much more complicated, just like the full-size, full-scale corporation cards. Lastly, you have this rule book here. It's well written, it's well laid out, it's sort of short and to the point, it's only about 10 pages. Not a lot of examples, a couple of small sections to help you understand things, but the game is pretty straightforward to get through and, and to understand the different components of it. There's not a lot of nuance to it, not a lot of really particular finicky rules that you have to remember. So, getting into setup and then going through gameplay. Uh, each player is going to start with a player mat. They're going to start by placing one of their player cubes, everybody grab a color, um, stick one of your player cubes on the zero marker for the production line underneath each of your resources, your six resources. Because everybody by default is going to start with a production of zero for all of their resources. Each player is then going to be dealt one, oh, sorry, two corporation cards if you're playing with the full scale corporations or one of the beginner corporation cards if you're playing with the beginner corporations. If you're playing with the full scale and you're dealt two, you choose which one you want to play as, you discard the other one. Either way, the corporation card that you begin with is going to tell you how many mega credits you start with. That's the money in the game. Those again, marked by the metallic. All your resources are going to be marked by the metallic cubes. Uh, so you start with a certain number of mega credits. Slightly confusing, the mega credit symbol looks a lot like the euro symbol, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> so you start with a certain number of mega credits. And you may, if you're playing with the full scale corporations, start with some additional resources or resource production. So if it tells you that you start with a, a steel production of two, which is the sort of hammer and wrench symbol here, you would slide your player cube on that production line up to two, showing that every round you produce two steel from the get-go. Normally, most players would start with zero there. You may also start with some actual resources. So you would take metallic cubes and add those to the resource that you begin with. On top of that, you might have some additional abilities. For example, I know there's one corporation that allows you to place a city on the map right from the get-go, and you get some additional money for doing that. Um, but for the most part, factions or corporations, sorry, are just gonna have a special ability that you can use throughout the course of the game. Usually it's passive, it's triggered whenever another player does X or whenever you do Y, you get to gain an, an ability or some additional event happens. Um, so you're gonna get yourself set up there, get your starting mega credits, get any starting resources that you get, adjust your resource production as, uh, as the corporation states, and then take any starting abilities that it asks you to take. From there, you're ready to begin the game. Each player is going to be dealt 10 project cards. Now, normally there's a, pro uh, there's a research phase during every round in which each player will be dealt four, but the starting uh, round, you're gonna be dealt 10. Now, if you're a beginning player and you're using a beginning corporation, you just get to keep all 10 of those. 
That's not the normal rule though. The normal rule is you're dealt the 10, uh, or in further rounds you'll be dealt four. And of those, the ones that you wanna keep cost three each to research. Now this is separate from their actual cost to play, which is in the upper left corner of the card shown in mega credits. There might also be some restrictions listed to the side of that mega credit cost. For example, there have to be two oceans on the board in order to play this card, or the temperature has to be at least um, you know, 28 degrees, or the oxygen must be below 6%. Uh, those restrictions might be listed beside the mega credit cost. That's all irrelevant when you're researching. When you're researching, it's just, do I want this card? If yes, I spend three mega credits and I add it to my hand. If not, you discard it. You don't have to purchase any cards. You don't have to, or, or you could purchase all the cards. It doesn't matter, but they cost three apiece regardless of the regular cost to play the card. Discard the ones you, the ones you don't want, and then you have your starting hand. Starting with player one, who is normally the player who most recently won a game of Terraform Mars or whichever you want to choose, the player who knows the rules best is a good one to go if it's your first time playing. Each player is going to take two actions, or up to two actions, I should say. You could take one action or you could take no actions. If you take no actions, you've passed and you're out for the rest of the round. Every time it comes around to your turn, it's going to skip you. Once all players have passed, that's the end of the action phase. But if you take one or two actions, you're still in the mix. Here are the different actions that you can take for those one or two. Keeping in mind, you can take them in either order and you can take them more than once. So you've got play a card from your hand. Playing a card from your hand, you pay its mega credit cost in the upper left corner. You abide by any restrictions listed beside that mega credit cost, maybe a certain percentage of oxygen or a certain temperature, a certain number of oceans on the planet. You might also see a certain number of other cards having already been played by you. Uh, that'll be a reference to tags. Tags are these small circular symbols and you have a tag for science, you have a tag for space, you have a tag for earth, you have a tag for structure, all different types of tags or, or buildings. Um, so a card might say this card costs 15 mega credits and you have to have three science cards in play. The reason that that, uh, the, the way that you track that is cards that you put into play other than red cards, which will be face down, I'll get onto those in a moment, you'll be able to see their tags. They'll be sitting on the table in front of you, face up, and in their upper right corner, they'll have one or more tags listed. If a card says in order to play this, you have to pay 15 and have three science cards in play, you just check the cards you already have in play for the science tag in the upper left corner. And as long as you have at least three in play, and I believe, no, no. On some cards, you get to count the card itself, but not usually when it's a restriction to playing it. Uh, so if you had three science cards in play already, you could play that card. So that's your first action, play a card. If it's a red card, I'll go through the cards real quick. If it's a red card, that's an event card. You simply do what the card says. It'll show you both in sort of a pictogram sentence as well as written out in plain English what it does. Do what it does and then flip it face down. That card doesn't matter until you get to the end game scoring. Then you've got green cards. Green project cards happen and then you can cover them up and sort of stack them on top of each other uh, as long as you can see the tags in the upper right corner, because those tags are going to matter for the example that I just gave. If you had a card that you could only play if you had three science cards in play, you're going to be reading off of your green and blue tags for cards that are in play. Red cards are face down, they won't count until you get to end game scoring. So moving on, green cards, you play them, they happen, they sit there, you keep an eye on their tags. Blue cards are the most valuable types of cards, because you play them, they have an ability that happens immediately. That's usually at the bottom of the card. And then at the top of the card, you're gonna have a separate ability. That ability is either going to be passive and reoccurring or active and you can use it once per round. If it's passive, it's simply going to explain the trigger. For example, every time you play a microbe card or every time an opponent plays an animal card, this card does X and that'll just happen for the rest of the game. So that's great. You wanna keep that card in full view in front of you so you can see what it does. The other type of blue card has a big red arrow on it and it says, you can do X, you can uh, exhaust this card or, or use this ability, I forget exactly what language they use, to do X or to do Y, whatever it says. Um, that is uh, another sticking point for me in the rules. The rules, I believe, say you're supposed to take one of your colored player cubes and drop it onto that card when you use that ability to show that you've already used it this round and you remove it at the beginning of the next round to denote that it's now available to be used again. I don't like that because some of these cards, some of these abilities, um, are actually generating resources on that card, like mi microbes or animals or whatever specific resource that that card generates. And a lot of times these cards will work together. You might have one card that generates microbes, then another card that says, discard X number of microbes from any other card that you have and gain five mega credits. So those two obviously work together. Well, the way that you track the microbes on the card or the animals or whatever special resource it's producing is with colored player cubes. 
So if you're already tracking the resource on the card and then you add another one to show that you've used it, you have no way of denoting that that's why you put it there. And then when it comes around to your turn later in that round, you might look at that card and forget that you did that and think that that's just another microbe marker and you use it again. I much prefer exhausting or tapping the card, turning it sideways to denote that it's been used that round. It's much clearer and you can still use your player cubes to track any resource that it's producing. Much better system in my opinion. So getting back to things, uh, the first action you can take during your turn is play a card. Second action you can take is use a, bu a blue card, just like I explained. Turn it sideways if it's an active ability and do whatever it says it does. Uh, third action you can take is to use one of the standard projects. These standard projects right here are basically crappier versions of things that you could normally do with project cards if you've drawn the right kind of card. If you haven't, you might need to resort to these. So going through these real quick, and again, you can take these in any order and you could use both of your turn actions to use these. You could even use the same one twice. Uh, you could discard any number of cards from your hand and get paid one money from the bank each, one mega credit. That's obviously not a great deal because you paid three each to get them from your, your research draw, but at least you're recouping some money if you need it. For 11, you can increase your energy production. That's your production, not actually energy units you have right now, but the amount that you'll produce during every production phase going forward. You can spend 14 to increase the planet's temperature. Anytime you increase one of these three factors, oxygen, temperature, or place an ocean, you're also going to increase your terraform rating. Everybody has a terraform rating that starts at 20. You increase it by one anytime you increase one of these or, or place a tile, a uh, city, uh, sorry, an ocean tile. Um, this is going to affect two things. It's end game victory points, or it's some of your end game victory points, but it's also how many mega credits you produce. And I'll touch on that when we get to the production step in a minute. You can spend 18 mega credits to produce an ocean. You take an ocean tile, you stick it on any blue ocean space. Oceans are great. You don't get to own them for end game scoring, but they do a few things. If you place them on a space that shows any, um, any symbols, so plant symbols or uh, up here you have some card symbols, you would gain two plants, or you would draw two cards, or you would gain two steel. That's the actual resource, not production. So you would gain metallic, you know, cubes of it to spend right now, or to have right now. Um, so placing oceans gets you whatever you place them on top of. That's actually true for every tile type. Placing an ocean also immediately earns anybody who places a tile adjacent to that ocean from that point forward, even if it's not the person who placed it, two mega credits because building next to an ocean is nice. On top of that, um, placing an ocean counts as terraforming, so you get to increase your terraform factor. Um, next, for 23, you can place a greenery. A greenery is this green hex tile here. You do own greeneries, so wherever you place it, you're gonna put a player cube on it to show that you own it. Placing a greenery does increase the planet's oxygen level by one, and because you've increased one of the terraform ratings, or one of the terraform factors, you'll increase your terraform rating, which again is endgame VP and some mega credits next time you go through a production phase. The other thing about placing greeneries is that they have to be placed adjacent to a tile that you already own, if possible. So if you don't own any tiles, or if all the tiles you own are already surrounded, then you can place the greenery anywhere you want. Keeping in mind, if you place it next to an ocean, you'll get paid two mega credits. And again, don't forget to place your player cube on it to show that you own it. Uh, for 25 mega credits, you can do two things. Place a city and increase your mega credit production by one, which is great because now you'll produce one more mega credit every time you go through a production phase. Placing a city can be done on any tile. It can't be done on an ocean tile. Only oceans can be placed on ocean tiles, but you can place it on any tile, but you wanna try to place it adjacent to cities and oceans if possible. Oceans, because you'll earn the immediate two uh, mega credits for placing next to, next to an ocean, but next to a greenery because cities aren't worth any victory points at the end of the game, even though you've marked it because you do own cities that you place, they're not worth anything inherently. They're worth one victory point for every greenery adjacent to it, whether or not the greenery is yours. So cities are only worth as much greenery as they're near. So you wanna place your cities you know, wisely. Uh, so those are the different standard actions you can take. So again, so far going through the actions you can take on your turn, play a card from your hand, use a blue card that you already have in play, take one of the standard actions. You can increase uh, the planet's temperature by converting eight heat resources into one temperature increase. So on your little tracker there, if you have eight heat resources, not production, but the actual resources, you can discard those metallic cubes and increase the temperature by one, which in turn increases your terraform rating by one, which will be mega credits during production phase and victory points at the end of the game. You can discard eight plants similarly to produce a greenery tile. So you discard those metallic cubes back to the bank. You take a greenery tile, you place it anywhere on the board. Board, following the same rules, either adjacent to something that you already own 
if possible, or anywhere you like. Um, wherever you place it, you're gonna gain any symbols that you place it on top of. So it might be some cards, it might be some steel, it might be some plants. And again, you wanna try to place it next to cities that you own or oceans so that you can get some free money or some victory points at the end of the game. And in placing that, you're going to increase the planet's oxygen level, which will in turn increase the uh, terraform rating for you. So there's a lot of like rippling effects as you go through these. Um, last couple of options here, you can j activate a milestone or an award. So these are sort of the two more complicated features to what you can do during your turn. If you wanna activate a milestone, first you have to meet the standard for the milestone, the requirement. So this terraforming milestone, you have to have at least a 35 terraform rating on the track up here. So if you have at least a 35 and you're the first person to think of it, you can spend eight mega credits and take one of your player cubes and stick it down there. That just means that at the end of the game, you'll get a bonus five VP. If you have three cities that you own on the map, you can do the same thing. Spend eight, put a player cube on mayor, and you now gain five VP at the end of the game. Uh, gardener is if you have at least three greeneries, spend eight VP, put a player cube on that, you now get five VP at the end of the game. Builder is if you have at least eight cards with the building um, symbol on them, the building tag. You spend eight mega credits, you put your marker there, and at the end of the game, you'll get five victory points. And then planner, if you ever have a hand size of 16 cards, and there is no max hand size, but you can imagine how that would be hard because cards cost money to earn, and you'd have to not be playing them in order to build up to 16, you can spend eight mega credits and put your player marker there to earn five VP at the end of the game. So they all cost eight, they all earn you five VP, and those are what they require. However, only three of those can be activated in any given, day, any given game. So once three have been activated, the other two are locked out. They can never be activated. The same player or multiple players can choose them. It's first come, first serve. But as soon as three have been picked, the other two are locked out. Coming over to awards, we have a similar but different system. So a player can choose one of these awards to activate. The awards are uh, Landlord, which is the player with the most, uh, the player that owns the most tiles at the end of the game, so cities and for um, greeneries. Uh, Banker is the player with the highest mega credit production at the end of the game, not the most money, but the highest production at the end of the game. Scientist is the player with the most science cards in play at the end of the game. Thermalist is the player with the most heat resources, not heat production, but actual heat resources at the end of the game. And then Miner is the player with the most combined steel and titanium resources, not production, resources at the end of the game. A player can activate one of these sort of competitions for eight mega credits if it's the first one to be activated. Uh, say they choose to activate Landlord. There's now basically a miniature competition going on that didn't exist prior to that, where at the end of the game, whoever has the most owned tiles will get five VP, and whoever owns the second most tiles will get two VP. It's always five for first, two for second. So a player can activate the Landlord competition. Another player could come in and activate the Scientist competition. The second award activated costs 14 mega credits to activate. And then a third player could come in and activate minor. The third award activated costs 20 to activate. After three have been turned on, the other two, similarly to milestones, are locked out and cannot be turned on for the rest of the game. So three milestones can be activated, first come, first serve. Three awards can be activated and will be calculated at the end of the game, but the other two are still locked out. First place gets five, second place gets two. Each player that nabs one of these will get five. So those are the other two actions you can take on your turn. So going through it real quick, play a card from your hand, use one of your standard actions, use a blue card that you already have in play, convert eight plants into a greenery, convert eight heat into a temperature increase, claim a milestone, activate an award. Those are the actions you can take during your turn. You can choose one, two, or zero of them. If you choose one or two, you're still in play and you're gonna keep going around the table from one player to the next until everybody has chosen zero, which is a pass. Once everybody has passed, we move on to the production phase. The production phase is that each player is first going to convert all of their, their energy into heat. So all of your energy units will become heat units. Then each player is going to gain resources equal to the number tracked on the resource tracker, the, the resource production tracker. That's where you have your player cube. If it's on zero, you gain none of that resource, which is how most resources are going to start the game. Uh, the only one that's special is mega credits. If you look at mega credits, it actually shows you gain your current TR rating on the track around the edge, plus the current production shown on the tracker. So even if your production is zero, you're always going to gain some mega credits because everybody starts at 20 and goes up from there. So the more you focus on terraforming the planet, the more this tracker will increase, the more mega credits you get at the production phase of every round. Now, a couple things I wanna to touch on real quick. 
like how plants can become greeneries and thermal units can become temperature increase, uh, steel and titanium also have some special abilities. B uh, steel can be used on cards that have the building tag at a rate of two to one. So if a card costs 10 mega credits and has the building tag, you could instead spend five steel. If a card costs 12 and you only have five steel, you can spend the five and spend the remaining two in mega credits. So you can only use steel on structure cards, on building cards that have the building tag, but it's a better value than using all mega credits. Titanium, similarly, works the same way, but at a rate of three to one and on space cards that have the space tag. So again, you can only use titanium on space cards, but it's a value of three to one. So a card that costs 15 is only five titanium, or a card that costs 17 is five titanium and two mega credits. So those have additional value. So that's how you go through the action phase. You'll go through the production phase. You'll transfer your energy into heat. You'll produce all the rest of your resources, keeping in mind to factor in your current TR into the amount of mega credits that you produce. And then you'll ready all of your exhausted blue cards, if you have any. You'll pass the player one marker to the player to your left, and you'll begin the whole thing again. Everybody will draw four cards, and it's four for the rest of the game after the first round, which starts with 10. You're gonna draw four cards. You're gonna choose which of them, if any, you want to acquire. You pay three per card to acquire. This is the research phase. You add them to your hand, discard any that you don't want, and then starting with player one, you go through another action phase. You've got those eight options of actions you can go through, playing cards, activating blue cards, choosing standard projects, activating milestones, awards, turning green plants into greenery, heat into heat, um, placing oceans, all the different things that you can do. Um, and you continue the game like this, moving your generation tracker one space every time you go through a round, moving your player terraform ratings as you do stuff, tracking your oxygen, your temperature, placing your oceans. And once your oxygen hits the top of the bar, your oxygen hits the top, sorry, your temp hits the top of the bar, your oxygen hits the top of the bar and all nine oceans have been placed, you end the game. You finish that sort of generation out and then you calculate end game VP. So end of the game VP, you're going to get, uh, based off your Terraform rating, that's instantly just gonna convert into VP, so that's sort of your, your starting number, and then you can use your cube to track on the outer border just to sort of keep things going while you're calculating your end game. So your Terraforming converts directly into um, end game victory points. You calculate who has won milestones. You calculate who has won awards. You calculate tiles on the board. So if you have a greenery, uh, that's worth one. If you have a city, that's worth one for every greenery adjacent to it. Uh, and then lastly, you're going to calculate um, any victory points off of the cards that you have in play. Some cards will earn you end game victory points. For example, a card might be worth two victory points for every science card that you have in play. Now at this point, you can flip your event cards back over and count their tags towards end game victory points. They only stay face down during the game so that they don't count for playing cards throughout the course of the game. But at the end of the game, you can calculate them. So let's go ahead and do a proper review here. First off, we have theme and immersion. I'm going to give Terraforming Mars a two. I feel like it is very thematic. I feel like it brings in some real world scientific elements into the game and it really gets you into the mood of being this sort of semi-corrupt, semi-moral, ethical corporation that's trying to take advantage of Mars while also terraforming the planet for later inhabitants. I feel like going through the different project cards and manipulating your resources really kind of gets you into that vibe and it really pulls you into the theme of the game. So a solid two for theme and immersion. Going on to cost versus quality, the game does have some component weaknesses. These player sheets or player mats, whatever you want to call them, on this flimsy, not even card stock paper, uh, that that's kind of a letdown for the, the overall sort of aim of this game and the cost of the game. I would expect something a little better than that. Usually, you know, you get your standard cardboard or slightly denser cardstock player mats. So that's a little bit of a letdown. Um, and then as far as this deck of cards goes, which is most of the imagery that the game sort of has to offer, the graphics on these cards or the, the images, the artwork on these cards is kind of all over the place. You've got some that looks like it's custom illustration. Then you've got some that looks like it was slapped together using some free space photography that was found on the internet. Um, it's just really a mishmash of quality. And uh, again, you would think that there would be a sort of a standard, if not a higher standard, at least a standard. There's a lot of variance in the different types of art that can be found on these cards. And it can be a little jarring at times. It almost pulls you out of the game because it's so surprising to see something so low budget. It almost looks like, you know, a, a Kickstarter, like launch prototype that you would show to somebody that doesn't quite have the real art yet. Um, it's not horrible, but it's not great. So I'm gonna give it a one for cost versus quality. Um, onto ease of use. 
I would give it a two because there's nothing overly complex about interacting with this game. Uh, it's not so big that it doesn't fit around or in the center of your standard size table. Everybody's gonna be able to reach stuff. You can split the project card into two separate decks so that players on the separate sides of the table can have their own little space to work in. Same with your resource cubes. And of course, everybody has their own player cubes. Um, same with the hex tiles. You can separate those onto either side of the table. So easy to work with in that essence. But it does suffer from something I call the bump factor. And that is that if you happen to nudge or bump your player sheet, whether you go to reach for something and you clip it with your hand, or you lean too far into the table and part of your body presses up against it suddenly, or maybe just another player accidentally while moving stuff around on the board, reaching for a tile, they bump into it. That's going to throw all of your cubes out of position. And in a game where each row, each tracking uh, production row underneath each of the resources has its own cube, and then each of the resources also has the number of units of that resource that you have measured in the same types of cubes. If those get askewed enough, you're not going to be able to correct that. You're not gonna be certain, you know, was this cube in steel or was it in titanium? I mean, maybe if you had zero titanium and you're certain of that, you'll be good to go. But other than that, if you have a bunch of cubes that get jostled around, you're never gonna be certain of where they were. And you might not even be able to tell where your production trackers were. Were you producing three steel or two steel? Was that, you know, two energy or four energy? You know, did you play that card that adjusted your mega credits by one or had you not played it yet? Was that an earlier round? Has that been undone by another effect? Where exactly should that tracker be? It can, it can screw you up really bad, especially once you get further into the game and you start reaching double digits on some production, which is something that you can happen if you progress far enough. You're not gonna be certain where those two cubes for that one resource were. And it's, it's really obnoxious. Uh, a lot of games have this. Some games have figured out ways to deal with it and to prevent it from happening. Um, or they've sort of got mechanics worked out where it doesn't necessarily matter if you bump them because it's so obvious where everything was. Um, but in this game, it can really be a nuisance if it happens to you. So I'm gonna knock it down from two points to one point there on ease of use because that bump factor can be really brutal if it happens at the wrong time to the wrong person who's not paying attention. Uh, moving on from there, we've got enjoyable. I think this game is very enjoyable. I think it's it's gonna be hard to have a bad time playing this game. It's not overly aggressive. It's not super competitive. There is some interaction between players with the corporate style project cards and some of the sort of cruel interactions where you can sort of wipe out another player's resources or cause them to discard cards, things like that. But for the most part, those are minimal. Um, and it's not gonna be anything that's gonna ruin the game for anybody. As far as actually working on your own strategy, building your own sort of corporate infrastructure, choosing your projects, car project cards, getting your little engine going, manipulating your resources and being as efficient as you can with those, that's all sort of on you. Uh, the only downside to that, and this is again, something that a lot of games have, is that the Terraform rating, which is basically your primary source of victory points come the end of the game for the most part, is visible throughout the course of the entire game. So everybody can see where every other player is. And I kind of wish that most games didn't have that. There are a few games where it's factored into the mechanics of the game, like this one. Obviously your terraform rating is based off of how much you've affected these three different terraforming factors. It also sort of works its way into what your mega credit production. So it's necessary to be there, um, but it starts to feel a little frustrating and almost defeating if you see one player sort of scooting their way towards the front of the pack and slowly gaining more and more distance from the other players because it almost starts to feel like, well, what's the point? They're so far ahead that, you know, we've only got a few more rounds maybe before the game closes out. Nobody's gonna catch them. Um, and, you know, people can do that kind of math in their head and it starts to get a little you know, you start to feel a little defeated. Um, so I wish that wasn't there, but at least in this game, it's built into the mechanics. So I'm not gonna, you know, throw points against it. So a solid two for enjoyable. I think most people are gonna have a lot of fun with this game. And then Teachable. The game has a little bit of a learning curve to it, but for the most part, that's because of some of the confusion that the components introduce. Um, as soon as you get past that, the game is very straightforward. When it's your turn, you can take zero to two actions. If you take zero, you're out for the round. If you take one or two, there's a list of eight actions you can choose from. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. It's not repetitive in a bad way, but it's repetitive in a sense that you start to memorize, okay, at any given time with this much money and these cards in my hand, I could do this, then this, then this, or I could do that, then this, then that. Oh, but if I do it this way, I earn a little bit extra and then I can spend it here and then that allows me to convert it to this. You start to work out these sort of engine mechanics that make the whole thing flow smoother and more efficiently for you. And it's really easy to get into that groove and start to figure things out. 
So I think it's a very teachable game. So going back and looking at our list for theme and immersion, we've got a two. For cost versus quality, we've got a one, mainly due to some of the weaker components in the game. Uh, for ease of use, we've also got a one due to that really obnoxious bump factor, which has a big impact on this game. For enjoyable, we've got a two. And for teachable, we've got a two. This game scores an eight out of 10. I would definitely recommend that you give it a try. Like I said, it's currently ranked fourth on Board Game Geek, which is pretty esteemed. Um, anything in the top 100, I would say, is probably worth giving a shot just on merit alone. Um, though some of my favorite games fall into the two, three, four, even 500s rank. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great game. It's a lot of fun. It's easy to learn. It's not too pricey to pick up. It plays one to five players. Solo mode is solid. I did try it myself. I'm not getting into the details of it here, but basically you've got 14 generations to win the game by yourself which is a very quick playthrough because you're not going back and forth between other players, you're just playing the whole game on your own. Every turn is your turn, every round is just you. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot of fun when I put it that way, but it's actually a lot of fun. It's like a really, really fancy version of playing Solitaire. Um, but yeah, great game. I definitely recommend you give it a try, pick it up if you get the opportunity to, if you think it's something you might like. I hope you guys have enjoyed this review. If you haven't yet, please go down below and subscribe. Make sure you click on that notification bell and set it to all. Otherwise you won't really get notified of anything and subscribing really doesn't do anything other than artificially boost my numbers, which I appreciate, but I want you to know when I post videos. Other than that, you can leave a like or a dislike. And if you have the opportunity, go down below and leave a comment. I love the opportunity to talk with you guys, whether it be about that video or any topic in general. I've heard recently that the YouTube algorithm is favoring comments over anything else because it shows viewer participation. Um, so that's cool. If you want to help me out, that'll definitely do something, I'm sure. Um, but other than that, I hope you guys have enjoyed and I will see you in the next one. Have a good night.